Hello, hello, it's a beautiful day at the classroom to be writing notes and getting carpal tunnel. My name is Brady Bissett, and today we're gonna to be talking about a few different aspects of this high energy hockey ad that I had shot with a couple of pro hockey players. And if you follow the NHL, you may be familiar with one in particular, and that's Mr. Tori Mitchell, who spent a very impressive 11 years in the NHL. But before we go ahead and dive into everything, I think it's only fit that we show you the ad and show you what we're working with and what we're gonna be breaking down. So it's movie day here at the classroom. Let's go ahead and roll that tape. So what do you think? You better like it. I hope you liked it. Did you like it? We're gonna be breaking down a couple different aspects of this. Unfortunately, not everything from start to finish, but I wanna talk about some of my pre-planning, of course, how I lit everything and how we got the look that we're going for, um, camera settings we're gonna talk about, and then some song choice and sound design and stuff like that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so going into this, I actually only was given a two hour time slot to come in, set up, film, and be gone. So I knew that I had to do a lot of the planning prior to coming in to make sure I was the most efficient as I could with my time. So there's a few different ways to do that. I know it's really stressful, but we're gonna talk about a few things that I did going into it to, just to prep myself and make everything easier for when I show up. And the first thing is, is know the look you're going for. Find reference projects, reference lighting, lighting charts, and just get an idea for the look that you want. For me, I knew I wanted to go for a low key and cool look, really cool on the color spectrum and kind of a monochromatic look. And once I figured out kind of like the look I was going for, then I started to look at their Instagram, their website, any of their social media, and just get a feel for what the venue looked like, what the facility looks like, so I can start to plan angles, uh, where I might place a light. And if you can, I did this and this helps a lot. Ask, your, ask the client if you can go on a day, like take time out of your own day and just go and look at everything. I went in and I just took iPhone pictures just to refer back to. So when I went back home, I can research it and kind of like draw up some diagrams or some charts on that. So by doing that, I gained a really good idea of what the facility looks like in person. And then I can find out any potential obstacles that might stop me, either lighting obstacles, control or lack thereof control of lights. Uh, any nooks and crannies you can put lights in, so on and so forth. So if you can actually go there to plan, that helps a lot as well. But if not, just do your research, know what you want, know approximately where you wanna put things, and then go from there once you get on location. So with all that said and done, and you kinda of know what the facility looks like, what you're really working with, that's when I took my time to really dive in to the lighting setup and what I wanted. And like I, like I said before, I really wanted those RGB tubes right in the back and made my foundation around that. So I figured that if everything was backlit by tubes, my subjects would probably be pretty silhouetted as they're skating around. So I figured that I'd at least need one light acting as a key light just to light their faces when necessary to skate the puck, so on and so forth. So between the tubes and that key light, I figured that was a good enough foundation lighting wise to be able to kind of manipulate things or micro manipulate things as I got there on location. So with the lighting foundation all said and done, the diagrams done up and all of that, I asked myself, how do I want it to look? I, and I figured that it's gonna be high energy, fast paced, a lot of action. So having fast camera movements and all of that would be appropriate as well. So I figured that easy rig with handheld setup would be the best way to go rather than running a gimbal. So now there's just a few different pre-planning topics that I wanted to touch on, but now we're gonna be here on location on site. And let's talk about how I lit this all first. And yes, that did just die. And um, I did forget to charge my batteries. So it's a pattern here at the classroom. So right as I got on location, since I had a very tight time constraint, right away I just measured out an equal distance between all the tubes or where they would be on the boards. And I mounted all four of my Nanlite Pavo tubes and then I used their remote and I set each tube to individual channels. So I had channel one, two, three, and four for the tube, one, two, and three, and four. So I had individual control of dimming some or turning up some and making others brighter or darker. And that made it a lot easier for a couple shots, especially the net shot. I actually turned off the tubes right behind me 
and that way I didn't have the tubes on the near side filling in much of the net and I wanted it to be backlit with that key light and the flaring and all of that. But backtracking once more, once I got all of the tubes up, what I did is just turn off all of the house lights. Just look at the camera, look what we're working with, look what we might be missing out on. And that led me to realize that everything was lit up nice in the background, but the background beyond that, like the actual wall was kind of falling off into darkness. And I realized that we could get a little bit more depth in there. So what I did was took a Nanlite mix panel and I put that just straight on the floor, shining up on their logo. So that did two things by shining on the logo of the wall. One, it gave us a little bit more depth by pulling that from the background, pulling it from the shadows. And also, especially with client work like this, if it's applicable, I always try to bring out the logo in a way that's kind of like subconsciously noticed throughout the video. So the viewers are left with it without knowing it's shoved in their face. So that brightened up the logo a little bit and just shined a little bit of like, hey, look at me on the wall. And then after that, the one last light that I added was that key light that I was planning on adding. And that I actually used Nanlite's brand new, the Forza 300B, it's a bicolor fixture. And that's a really, really cool light. And the bicolorness helped with the flexibility of lighting down the, or down the line. And what I did was set that high and off to the right, camera right. And pretty much backlit, but still enough to the side to where we get that far side key look that we know that we really like. And color temperature wise, I had that set to 5200 Kelvin or 5000 Kelvin. So that was a little bit warmer than the Pavo tubes, which were set to 6500, a really cool color temperature. So that way those tubes really stayed a little bit bluer and the light hitting our subject stayed a little bit more warmer or true to white. So then you get a little bit of color separation there, but I'm still sticking with this monochromatic color palette in a sense. And that's really all I had for my lighting setup. Nothing too intricate because I started to overthink everything and try to bring in too many fancy lights and do too many fancy things. And at that point, that's in my opinion, when you start to go downhill, you start to ruin it because you feel like you have to do too much. So less is more with this lighting setup. And moving on to camera settings, um, let's see, I used my Pocket 4K with a Sigma 18 to 35, and I used the 18 to 35 because one, I love it, but two, I was on a tight time constraint, as I said before, so switching to a wide to a kind of a mid tight, it would have wasted time with switching lenses and moving everything over, so having a little bit of flexibility from kind of like ultra wide and the somewhat mid tight on that 35 end, it, it was just enough for what I needed there. And then my camera's white balance was set to right about 3,500. So by doing that, the Pavo tubes in the background really start to blue up and get really cool like I had envisioned and like I wanted. And then it's still, it's not too far to the point where that key light at 5,000 is too cool as well. And I just kind of found a middle ground for what works best. And I found that 3,500 was pretty good for me. Okay, so you're gonna wanna listen to this because this is the pro tip of the day and not too many people stray away from this. So it's kind of our little unique secret. But what I did uh, shutter speed wise or shutter angle wise is take my 180 degree pretty typical shutter angle and brought that to 90 degrees and translating that over to shutter speed. That's like moving it from 1 50th of a second to 1 1 25th of a second. And by doing this, it makes your shutter speed faster and sharper. So you're not gonna get as much motion blur. And I realized that with the skating movements and adding on the handheld movements to that, there's gonna be a lot of motion going on. And if I have a traditional shutter speed or shutter angle, there's gonna be a lot of motion blur. Chances are I'd miss out on a lot of shots. So it gives you a really gritty and almost fast paced, sticky, cool look that looks great for a lot of action scenes like this. Of course, everything needs its own time and place. And I found that some fast paced ad like this would be great for having that fast shutter speed. And just to make things a little bit more difficult for myself, I decided why not? get on ice skates with a cinema camera and an easy rig and it's gonna be easy, right? No, but I do not recommend, um, you know, putting your gear at risk, yourself at risk. It was definitely a risky decision I made for the shot. So if you're like me and wanna risk damaging your gear for an extra cool shot, great. Please don't blame me. And if not, if you don't feel confident, that's okay. But it really led me to get a couple more really cool dynamic shots and keep up with them as they're skating and moving around the ice. So I'm really glad that I did that. But again, please don't get hurt. Please don't hurt your camera or yourself more importantly. Okay, so shoot's done. It was wrapped. It was actually a blast. I had a lot of fun shooting with all of those guys over there, but now we're in the post side of things. And first and foremost, the thing I want to talk about most is a song choice. And I struggled with finding it. Like, I mean, struggle. I looked for seven hours 
and I couldn't find a song. So I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And then I called up my friend Roland, he's a composer, and I called him up and I was like, dude, what do I do? And I've been looking for so long and he's like, my heart hurts for you. I'm gonna whip something up here. So him and I talked a little bit and we went back and forth and found a direction that we wanted to go. And then he did his thing and then came back and absolutely killed it. Like he made the perfect piece for the mood that I was looking for. It was awesome. So first of all, thank you, Roland. But unfortunately, we can't always have a Roland on each project. And what I mean by that is we can't always just run to a composer and it's okay to look on those music sites for music or songs. But what I'm really saying is on a project where you're passionate about or it's really important or the budget can just afford to have somebody custom score a song or a piece or soundtrack for your project, it's definitely beneficial because that way you can pace everything exactly how you need it and you don't have to work around somebody else. And it's super helpful. So I wanna extend a huge thank you on here to Roland and please everybody go check him out. I'm gonna put all, all his information down below. He's not asking me to do this. I'm just doing this because he just simply killed it. So I'm gonna leave his Instagram and his website and all that down below and you too can now have a Roland. And then one more thing that I did just to really take everything to the next level and add a new aspect is I went back and I recorded some sound effects just of the skates, the puck, the them skating around the boards and all of that stuff. And by adding in sound design afterwards between the atmospheric and some other ones as well, it adds an entire new dimension to the project. It makes it feel as if the viewer while watching is really there and experiencing the sights and the sounds and everything. And it puts them in the project or in the scene. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video with no sound, just the sound effects, so you can see what it really does and the difference that it makes. And all of the sounds were just a series of skate sounds, like hard stops, hard turns, uh, slap shots, and all of that stuff I had assembled the whole project or just a basic idea of the project and watched it on my iPad and said, okay, I need a sharp turn. I need to make sure I get this hard stop. I need to do this and that to make sure I get the, uh, the accurate sounds. So a combination of those atmospheric sound effects, as well as just your traditional like whooshes, uh, risers, and hits, just to add a little bit more pop to the atmospheric sounds, that's all I really did. I mean, I'm not a sound engineer. I'm not perfect when it comes to that, but I knew I wanted to add in one more dimension with the sound design. So I know I didn't cover every single thing in this project, and I know that my BTS was kind of on the fly and run and gun. Again, we didn't have a lot of time, so I am sorry, but I still hope that you found this helpful and educational and entertaining so you can do something like this on your projects and be creative in your own ways. But that's all that I'm gonna be covering for you guys today. I, if you're still here, make sure you hit the subscribe button, the like button, the share button, do all of that. I really appreciate you guys sticking around and I hope you have fun with your projects in the future. And you know the drill. See you guys.